Hi, everyone. Jen Hatmaker here. I am your host of the For the Love podcast. You guys, welcome to the show. If you could hear me smiling, it's because I am. Because I just finished today's episode and I'm pumped to bring it to you. We are in a really cool series um, right now called For the Love of Black Trailblazers. And we are speaking to super high level black women in their various fields. Um, they have, they are accomplished. They are credentialed. They are breaking barriers. They are breaking ceilings. They're like best in class in their industries. And it's so it, like for me, empowering and inspiring to talk to every single one of them. Um, and of course, for me, this is all year long. Obviously, it's Black History Month, um, which is which matters. Uh, it matters that we are honoring um, Black artistry and Black creativity and Black excellence and just the Black contribution to the American culture. Um, but as we know, it should really be Black History Year. So, you know, for better or for worse, whatever, whatever about Black History Month, but it is particularly this month. And so we're overlaying it with this particular series. Um, but I'm just telling you, like every one of these interviews is so powerful. And uh, I'm, I feel so connected to it too, as a woman, um, as I hear these women pushing into these areas that have been previously closed to women in general. And then you add this racial layer on top of it and you realize these women are stars. Wait till you hear who we have today. <laughs> Talk about a star. I mean, she's just an absolute force. I mean, not only as a professional, but as a human. So you guys, today we have Asia Wilson. If you know, you know. Asia is a pro athlete. She's a professional basketball player for the Las Vegas Aces. I mean, we have a pro level athlete on the show today and she's not just a pro. She is arguably one of the best ever, really. I mean, just considered one of the greatest athletes in pro women's basketball ever. She's a two-time MVP. She is the face of the WNBA. Um, she helped lead the USA women's national team to gold at the 2022 um, FIBA Women's World Cup, the Tokyo Olympics, the 28, 2018 FIBA World Cup. She is coming off of two back-to-back -back national championships. She's, she, what, she's got it all. I mean, she has literally all the gold medals. And on top of that, she's a stellar teammate, a beautiful person and an incredible leader. Among other things, she's the creator of the Asia Wilson Foundation, which we're going to talk about for a little bit. It's a resource for kids who struggle with dyslexia and, some, and other learning um, disabilities. And she has this incredible foundation surrounding them and their teachers and their families. She is releasing her very first book this month called Dear Black Girls. I really loved talking to her about this today. Uh, in fact, listen, this is the first lines of the description of her book. This one is for all the girls with an apostrophe in their names. This is for all the girls who are labeled too loud and too emotional. This is for all the girls who are constantly asked, oh, what did you do with your hair? That's new. This is for my black girls. Oh, Ugh. Ugh. you know, incredible. Um, she shares her real story, her real heart and her real life in her book, um, what she's faced, what she's learned, what she's overcome, who's built her, the women she admires. And, and then just outside of all that, she's just low key, a champion. <laughs> um, the city of Vegas is obsessed with her, um, and her, and the franchise that she literally helped build. She's in her seventh year in the WNBA and, I mean, really, the world's her oyster. We're lucky to have her, you guys. We are lucky to have a woman of this caliber at this level um, who's literally killing the game. So what a great conversation today. You're going to love it, too. Welcome the absolutely wonderful Asia Wilson. 
Um, Asia, welcome to the For the Love podcast. I had to just tell you that I was a little bit starstruck. And so this is me playing it cool. And I wonder how I'm doing. <laughs> you're doing well. I would give you a solid A plus. Like you're God, really I knew it. I, no. <laughs> I knew it. I knew I could be believable if only I tried. Um, it's awesome to have you here. And it's incredible to watch you. And your career is astonishing. And you are. And um it's thrilling i couldn't be i it just i'm so delighted when really really good success comes to good people and i I've, I've told my listeners obviously a little bit about you. your credentials are like so long but i don't know if you wouldn't mind where we start here walking and walking back a little bit to the beginning um and putting a little context around your life and your experiences. Can you talk uh, for a minute or two about your, about coming up, about your upbringing, um, where you're from? Obviously your roots are like really special to you, really precious. Home is, means a lot to you, your family, all of it. I'd like to hear about them. And then specifically, as we're going to kind of get into this a little bit more, I'd like to hear if you don't mind your experience as a fourth grader with maybe your first really big run in with racism. So that can be at the end. Yeah. If you can like onboard us to that part. <laughs> yeah, I got you. No, I am a South Carolinian through and through. I obviously was born and raised there. And growing up, I was out of a small town. It's not Columbia, the capital. It's a little small town out called Hopkins. And when I tell you my neighbors were just right in front of me, that's all I had. It was that and then trees, all I knew. So, um, I went to, my parents put me in private school first through 12th grade, and I loved it. They gave me, every four years, they were like, you want to go public school? I was like, no, like, I love it. I love my friends. I love just the feel of Heathwood. Heathwood was the family. It was very, like, small. Like, our biggest class, we were the biggest class, and I think it was maybe, like, 60 of us. So it was very small. It was, like, a very small town, and I love that. I love being in small places then I can really gravitate to different people. And uh, obviously my family isn't the smallest, but we are a little small family uh, in South Carolina. And I've always been my grandma on my mom's side. And then my granddad on my dad's side lived maybe like 10 minutes away from each other. So grew up obviously in the church. My dad was a, uh, a preacher's kid. So we grew up in the church a, a little bit, not too much, but there. And then we would just drive I stopped by granddad's house and drive by and stopped by grandma's house. So I was very oriented. I was very like, I love that feeling of it. I love going to grandma's house and my cousins would be there and different things like that. And then just growing up, uh, I started to turn into this basketball player. I wasn't always Asian. Absolutely hated the sport, hated to sweat, hated everything. It was just disgusting to me. I was just like, ew, I just want to be a girly girl, chill on the couch and be good. Obviously, my mom was like, no. And my dad was like, heck no. So <laughs> um, I grew up. That's when I started getting into different sports uh, when I was in school. And I tried everything. And then basketball was just something that stuck with me. But growing up in that private school for so long, it was very hard for me because I didn't see a lot of people that looked like me. But I really didn't see it as a problem because that's all I knew. You know, I'm a kid. It's like that was my world. That's all I knew. I went to school. I went home. That was it. But as I got older in the school, I was like, ooh, it's, it ain't a lot that looks like me around here. And it kind of put me in this situation where it was like not uneasy, but it was like guards started to go up that I really didn't know then. But now, obviously, as I got older, I was like, oh, yeah, you're putting those guards up. And ran into a situation in fourth grade. I, a young girl, like my friend, like any other thing, was just like, yeah, I had a birthday party. Cool. I was like, okay, yeah, like, all right, cool. And then she was like, well, things would be different because I was black. And I was like, wait, what? Like, it was something that I just couldn't comprehend because I'm like, you literally go to school with me. Like, your parents don't know that they're black children at this school. And it was just very mind blowing to me because that's when I kind of remember going to my parents. Like I was just so confused at the fact that I was like, how is this real? Like, how is this real? Like, what is this? What is going on? I go to school every day. It's not like I just popped up today and was like, hey, like, no, we've been going there for some years. And that was my first eye opening experience. Of course, first of many. That's the world that we live in. But it was an experience for me that I'm so glad that I had to go to go go through. I grew through it. I grew through it because I'm like, hey, 
everything is not, I can't think that everyone moves in the world like me. And so growing up, it made it a little easier because now I'm like, okay, I got to keep my head on a swivel for all of these things. But it was still tough, you know, it was still very, very tough because I'm like, we were friends, like, we're good. We literally like all class together, like what makes me that different? And it was the color of my skin, point blank period. And being in the South, eh, they get down different. But then it's beautiful to see how I go from that young girl to now having a whole statue on that in the same city that I ran, I had that problem with. And I think that is where I love to see that. Because that like, yeah, like it's like tangible things that I can hold on to to say, no, change doesn't happen overnight, but boy, is it coming. Like it, it's there. And uh, yeah, I love South Carolina. I do. That's my home, obviously. But it's a it's obviously we all have a lot of work to do. But that right there was just kind of the upbringing of Asia. Like I didn't have a hardcore childhood. My parents uh, equally supported me. We're equally in the home. We still are. They're still so supportive. I didn't have that nitty gritty story that everyone normally looks for. I had the chill and like my parents were like, OK, get your grades, go play basketball, have fun, live life. And that's literally it. And that's where I am today. <laughs> Mm. Do you remember how your parents walked you through that particular experience, but then all the however many experiences then that were layered on and layered on the older you got, the the um, the longer you went? How, how did your parents couch racism for you? How did I mean, you're nine. You're just a baby. It's so hard to understand why you are experiencing what you're experiencing with your classmate that you've been in school with since kindergarten. Um, how did they how did they parent you in those yeah. years? Yeah, well, obviously, and it's crazy because I'm like, it was so long ago, but yet that's how deep rooted it was to me because I still like it's still I, I just remember my parents kind of like, you know, parents are kind of like, I can't show you my emotion because you won't understand, but this good and I remember my dad was just like very heated because my dad is what 70 71 now so he's been through the change of it all like he like he was with schools that were just starting to integrate like it was that so like he couldn't go to the University of South Carolina because he was black my mom's mom couldn't even walk the campus because she was black so you could tell that they just a lot of feels and emotions went through them because they're like, nothing's changed. Like this was something they were going through as kids. And now here they are, their young daughter is coming to them. Like nothing's changed. It's still the same. So it was a lot of hurt in them and a lot of pain that now that we talk about it now, but back then they were really just like, you don't change. Like you don't try to confide into the cookie cutter situation of a young girl that they want you to be like you don't and they always told me that like be true to you like never switch up because it was time i mean it's what i i wanted to straighten my hair bone straight i do like try to do everything my mom's like you can't do that, baby girl like that's not you and so i think it's the way they parent me and the way that they helped me through was telling me just be myself like if you feel something do it or don't do it. Like it's never lose sight of that. And I'm grateful for that because it kind of made me stop in my tracks a little bit and think about how do I want to approach different things? Like I said, it even in my book, I was like, you know, men get the talk all the time. The talk is like, be aware of your surroundings. Understand when you see a show your hands, you have to be this and like look a certain way. Don't do this. And I'm like, but that young that girl gets nothing. <laughs> we don't, we don't get the be aware of your surroundings. We don't get the always put your head on a swivel, like for those reasons. And they, and my parents gave me that talk. My mom was like, you have to understand that not, no one cares that you're Asia Wilson. <laughs> no one cares that you run up and down of a basketball court. You are a black woman, you're walking. So that it can be a threat to anyone. And so for them, they just were real with me. They honestly were just real with me and was like, this is how it is. This is how you can try to navigate it. And then from there, I just kind of figured it out on my own. I'm going to put a pin in that because obviously you've come in, like this is just a real full circle moment. You're about to put a book out that is really, this is your moment. It, it's your microphone. It's your time um, to be instructive and inspiring. And so I want to get to that in just a second, but I want to talk about the ensuing years because 
you just went on out and built an over the top career that you just went ahead and did it. Like, um, I'm tickled to hear you talk about just want to sit on the couch and not play basketball. I am so sorry. That was not your destiny, (laughs) ma'am. That, that was never, ever going to happen. So I wonder if just for a few minutes, we can't sit here on this, on this interview and not talk about your college years. And then obviously you're just, you're a pro athlete. It's just the rarest air. It's the teeniest percentage of human beings that have made it not just to your level, but with your particular set of credentials and awards and accolades and accomplishments, it is, it's, no, I don't know, there's no one else. So can you talk a little bit about how you just went ahead and built a huge life? Yeah. Um, I honestly don't know where it came from because like I mm. said, like I, you can ask me what I'm pretty chill. I am out of the way. I'm just here. Like, I'm just here. I'm loving it. I love my life that I live. And so when it came to winning, it's just something that I just fell in love with. Growing up when I didn't play and I was on the bench, I was like, dang, my teammates are having a lot of fun. But I still felt like I wasn't contributing to the win. So I was like, I can't really celebrate. I don't want to be that bench player that's like, we did it. And it's like, you did nothing. (laughs) When I got that, I was like, no, I want to be a part of it. So that's when I started to develop this passion for basketball. Like I just developed it. It was on every TV. I was just like, where can I watch it? How can I play it? What can I do? And it just started to become me. Like it just started to consume in a sense. And I was just like, I just want to be the best. Like what is it going to take for me to be the best? How can I be in a way that young girls now want to turn on the TV and watch me? Like what gets me to that And my dad was like, hard work, (laughs) literally hard work and understanding that you can't stop and the sacrifice to get there. And ever since then, I was like, "Okay, cool, let's let's start knocking these things down. Let's start checking these boxes. And if you would have told me at the age of 12, barely even getting my uniform washed because I didn't play, that I would be the number one recruit leaving high school, headed into college, I would laugh because I'm like, way like I don't care about this this is not it like I said I hated sweating I didn't like when my teammates would sit next to me and so I'm like girl get away like but then I was I'm just like I love it I, I love it and I, I wanted to inject into my veins that's how much I love it and then that's South Carolina and I was able to be coached by the phenomenal Hall of Famer Don Staley and that's when life started to like really get going it was like okay, no, I'm here. I'm enjoying myself. And I'm starting to make a staple in college basketball. And I mean, it's incredible to know that like the things that we've done there at South Carolina is forever there. And I love the legacy part of it. Like I love going back, seeing that uh, first national championship banner hanging up and like being seen, like I was a part of that. And that there just fueled me to the next level where I'm like, yes, like that's something that you just can't take away. And that's what I think about when I think about my championships and anything. I'm like, they were cool, but I love the fact that no one can take that away from me because it's it's hard. It's so, so hard to to win, but uh, let alone sustain it. I think that's that gets it. Like, it's easy to do it. Like, you okay, cool. Yeah, you're in it. You're there. You're playing pro. Okay, cool. But can you stay pro at a very high level? And I think that's the part that people miss. And so for me to have my name in that conversation at such a young age too, like people are like, oh my God, you're so young. Even though I feel like I'm like, ooh, it's been a lot of years. They're like, you're so young. You're right, I am. Like I can enjoy this. And that's the beautiful thing about it is like, I can still enjoy it. I can still enjoy my parents going to see my statue. I can still enjoy like my teammates in the locker room, running up and down with my puppies. Like I can still enjoy those moments, but it has been truly a journey that I never would have thought I would even- Believe it. Like, it's just so, it's so, so rare, really. So rare. Like it's, and people don't even understand, like in, uh, in college, you know, we won like four SEC championships. Like that was like, oh my gosh, yes. Like that was it. But then now at the pro, and I still can't believe we did it back to back. Like some days I'm just like driving to my workouts and I'm like, like I literally put on a, a, um, a championship shirt that was like 2022 and I like stood in the mirror and I was like, Oh my God, we did it again. Like we, like, we have another shirt. And I think those are the moments that I hang on to the closest. Cause I'm like, 
this is never it like it's been 10 years since this has been done and i was a part of that <laughs> like it's just it's it's so phenomenal. special <laughs> it it's really so spe- vegas is so bananas for you uh, just bonkers for you my my boyfriend was raised in vegas his family's still there and when i told him you were coming on the show today he just he only just said two words to me he's like holy shit i'm like oh, i know like i know i mean it just you are beloved and you brought something to the city that is that captivated a city that's hard to captivate. There's a lot going on there. You know what I mean? There's you have a lot of noise and competition for everyone's loyalty and even just their just their eyes. And they have lost it, lost it over you and the team. And did you did you when did you catch a, a dream and a vision for being a pro athlete? Was it in college or was it sooner? Was it in high school? Oh, mm, I would probably say like, I always say I'm a late bloomer. So I would maybe like, like junior, senior year in high school, I was like, okay, like this could be cool. Like I would like, I would love to just be in the WNBA. Like that was like my next thing. Cause I'm like, okay, what am I going to do in my life? Once I get to college, get a degree, what am I doing? Like what's next? And that's when I started to kind of be like, oh, I, I, I could see myself in the pros. Like I could, I could see myself there. Like either it's like a five man or six man, but like being number one, I don't know. Uh, that was not even like to be in a goat conversation or a legend conversation hall of fame. My brain couldn't grasp that. Like, I was like, eh, I'm good. But yeah, maybe like late high school, I was just like, okay, I have to be decent because I'm number one recruit. So I'm like, someone, they like me. Like, I've got to be what I do. So that's when I was like, okay, I don't want to sell myself short. But like, I just couldn't have imagined being like a number one draft pick and then like going and changing the franchise. Like, I, no, I was like, I'm happy just to be on a roster at this point. <laughs> It's so, this is such an unfair question, but having now experienced probably something you, who can hardly even imagine what your career, what you've experienced in your career so far, if you had to pick, if you had to pick a favorite moment and it may be the obvious ones and that would make perfect sense. And maybe it isn't, but if you had to pick a favorite moment, in your in your pro career mm-hmm. so far what would you yeah. say it would definitely have to be the 2023 uh championship the most recent uh because when i tell you backs were against the wall all odds were stacked against us it was that times 10 <laughs> it was like it was in a moment where i just couldn't even understand like i'm still trying to grasp what happened <laughs> because it was just for real it was that incredible like it was just like yes we were number one seed yes we were our record was this it was like still we want y'all to lose like it was like no y'all don't deserve it and that right there it took me and my yeah like it was like we just and we saw a lot of things we read a lot of things about us everyone had something to say about us and we kind of kept it right we kept it under wraps we would talk about it in our locker room but we were like on court we're good like just keep the main the main thing and when it all went down and that championship came around it was so much we were all crying and it was just because we knew we went through so much like the first one was hard the first one was incredibly hard like i have never experienced that ever the amount of like exhaustion that I felt that was really hard. This second one was like, it just like another notch. It was like, we took it to the level and that's why I love it the most because I'm so many people weren't expecting us to do it. So, I mean, everyone in Barclays was like, we're going to go back to Vegas. We're going to go ahead and get it out. We're good. We can get it there. And it was like, no, (laughs) it was like, we had a moment where we were like, no. And it was just something I've never seen a collective group of women just really dial in and pour into each other. Like, we got this. And it was just incredible feeling. And it's something that I've never experienced before. And I have to say, that's my number one. I always say, like, when people would ask me before that, I would always say my senior year, my SEC championship. No one could top that game. Like, that was yeah. that was the game. But this one, yeah. it was. We found it. 
<laughs> found like, it. Yeah, <laughs> that was real palpable. You know, we were all watching, of course, and it it the, uh, it, it translated that sense that you just described of this sort of team cohesion that was almost like its own entity. It, I I don't know how to explain it except we felt that watching and um and the joy of it. And of course when people say you can't do it, that's just rocket fuel. Like <laughs> it is for me. I'm like you're going to watch me. You're going to watch me do it. I like that as your favorite moment and I wonder what would you say um, in your career has maybe been the most surprising thing that you've learned or something you didn't necessarily see coming, or it was sort of an, an ancillary something that you've learned just being in this, in this place on these teams with these women at this level? Um, oh, that's a good question. Hmm. I, I think just the biggest thing is just that's surprising to me is really how much work we put in. I think a lot of people see the end result. They send, they, yeah, they see that and they're like, oh my God, they make it look flawless and just easy. But the most surprising thing is how many times we cry together, how many times we pray together, how many times we just come in the gym and it's like, we don't have it, but we still find a way to dig it out. And those moments there is what makes those big, big moments incredible. Because you know those little moments when the lights weren't on, when you were in the gym by yourself, when it was the ball wasn't going in the rim and you were frustrated with yourself. And no matter how good you may do, someone always has something to say. I'm like, ah, oh, we can't have a better season. They're like, oh, well, it's something going on. And it's like, something but yet we still prevail like that there always it surprises me because I'm like people don't even know the half of it like yes we're hosting this trophy but I'm like we get it back in that locker room and we're just like stuck because we're just like oh my god like the sense of relief the sense of like whoo it's like always catches me by surprise because I'm like I'm like throughout the season I'm literally emotionally attached to the season like I'm just like the umbilical cord like Everything I'm there, I'm like, oh, it feeds me. It, it gives me this. It gives me the juice. And then once the season over, it's like, it snips it. And I'm like, oh, my God, what am I supposed to do? Like, where's my life? What am I? So that's always a how to, like, gain that back and gain that fuel back to keep pushing. And, and love it. I love it. Uh, I, I crave it all the time. And, uh, yeah, just having fun with it. The rhythm of like the pro athlete is just so outside of anyone else's normal experience. You know, we, you're, you're, it's feast or famine, like you're all in or you're off season. Like it's, it's such a strange rhythm to go back and forth. And, and I can imagine it can be disorienting to kind of come off, especially come off a championship and then just be like, I guess I'm gonna go to the grocery store and like get out bread. I, I don't know. I don't know what that feels like to then have to re-enter like life. Nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what a strange existence. It's crazy. Like sometimes I really have to like, I remember right after the championship, I was like starting to decompress and I just found myself like getting out of bed, like putting on my stuff. And I'm like, I don't have to go to a gym. Like I literally thought I was late for practice because I woke up late, but I'm like, I literally just woke up and I'm like, oh, I looked at it again. I was like, oh my God, it's 11 o'clock. And I was like, oh, it's 11 o'clock. And then I'm like, no. and my mom's like, what are you doing? I was like, I gotta go. And she's like, Asia, the parade is in like three days. You're good. So it's like, <laughs> it's like a whole new life that you're like, oh, like, thank you. It's the sense of relief. Like I'll probably cry after my championship more of relief than more of like happiness. <laughs> yeah, because, that makes like, so much sense. It's like, ah, oh, it's, it's hard, but oh, my God. that's what I love about it. <laughs> Um, we're about to get to your book because I'm excited to talk to you about that, but I just want to ask you, um, I'd like to hear your experience more or less. It's not one thing, of course, but with your fan base, it's interesting right now to watch. I'm a sports fan. I've been, I've been a sports fan my whole life. And so in my family, we were just exposed to like a wide range of sports. And I grew up with a sports dad and we had a bunch of daughters. And so we've all been on the fields. Like we just grew up, we grew up playing and caring about women's sports 
specifically, but men's of course too. So it's interesting to watch pro women. It feels like you're having a real moment. It feels like that you're, you're elevated right now and that more eyes than I've ever noticed are watching and not just watching excited and like pumped. And so I, I'd like to hear how many years have you been pro? This will be my seventh, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I'm headed so, I mean, do you experience a change even just in the last seven years oh, from the fans? Sure. Can you talk yeah, about that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, for uh, for me, I was in a really unique but also lucky situation. So I, I kept, when I got to Vegas, we were new everything, like new everything from top to bottom, new city, new coach, new franchise, everything. And so it allowed us to really – grow a fan base i remember my rookie year like we would have like oh like it would be cool we're barely making it we didn't even make playoffs like it was like people were coming to be like let's see what this is about like it was finally like vegas finally got something that people could bring their kids to so it was kind of like let's see what this is like let's see what they got going on and vegas being vegas it was like no we're going to put on a show and i love the line i think megan rapino said we're not a charity case. Like this isn't like a, let's go give the girls a shot. Like when they, it's, if, when people come to a game, they're like, oh no, this is legit. And it's funny when people tell me, cause I'm like, what did you expect? <laughs> but they expected like the half-ass, like they expected like, the, like, oh, okay, we got enough money to do this. And we got cute uniforms. And it's like, no, like, no, this is what we do. And so years go by and as we started winning more we really you could see that we were like water our fan base so now it was like oh i'm not just bringing my kids i'm bringing my brother and my sister and my mom now we're starting to grow and now it's like we're selling out games and people are really dialing in they're like oh my god halftime show we're i mean we have sections that coordinate what they're wearing like it's incredible to watch people not to understand that like no we're not a charity case no this isn't something that we just like Ah, just something to do in the summer. Like, no, this is my livelihood and I'm going to show you I'm really good at it. And I love the most about it because, I mean, I think it also comes from the athlete. That's why I really try to be super personable when it's like when people run into me or if they see me on social because I think the fact that fans understand that I'm human, it kind of pulls the heartstrings. It kind of gets them to, okay, yes, she's dyslexic or yes, she hates cheese or yes, she hates pineapple pizza. Like, it's be relatable. And I think that's the beautiful thing about us as women athletes is like we make it really relatable because it's like, yes, I play on my period. Like, yes, they hurt. Like it allows a fan base to connect with you. And I think that's the thing that we love to do with the Aces is like we like to connect with our fan base. Like we want you guys to know that we're human. We have fun. Yes, we have good days, bad days. And I think that's how you're starting to see the game grow. Like not only badass women that's really good at what we do, but I think some are connecting with players first and then it's like you go to a game and it's like oh my god they're great at what they do so now I want to buy that jersey now I want to get her candle buy her book like it's different ways because I think on the men's side it's like okay you jump high you run fast people are like oh give me but for us it's more like oh my god she's a mother oh my god she's like a, she's a business owner so it's like we have different ways that we connect with our fan base and I think that's what's really sparking the growth of the game. And I love watching sell out, yeah, in, in college games. Cause I'm like, yes. Cause then once they become pros, you become W fans. And it's like, you just grow, you take it to the next level. And I, right. I love being a part of it. Yeah. <laughs> it's fun to watch these young girls coming up right now mm -hmm. and the excitement that they are adding to the college level and they're just, they're, they're standing on your shoulders. You know, you've, you've plowed through some ground for them um, in a way that is going to be profound for the girls coming up behind you profound. They're going to be able to race forward where you're kind of having to hack away at it in a lot of places. And so it's, it's exciting to watch that and just to know exactly what you just said, what that's going to mean for the future of the sport. Um, where it is a huge money maker. We know this is capitalism. So, I mean, there's a reason it's sports are still highly patriarchal because that's where people put their money. And so knowing that women's sports can bring the cash too. I mean, that's what speaks. Um, and so it's ha selling out crowds. I mean, it's, it's, 
It's incredible. It's incredible. I mean, South Carolina and LSU women, they're literally having a college game day. And I, I remember watching college game day just for like college football. And it's like now we're getting into it to where it's like, oh no, people are paying attention. And that's what I love the most about it. It's like, once you wait, because people are always like, how can we grow the game? What can we do? I'm like, just go to a game and then you'll speak for itself. Like I can't, I can sit here and be like, oh, we do this. And, we, and you're still going to be like, okay. But if you go to a game and you experience the, the just feel of it, then you understand exactly why people are pouring so much into it. And I'm like, now it's just a matter of time. Like it's just, it's, it's starting to just rock and roll. That's and it's right. A- <laughs> That's right. And it's, it is a case too, of that, that rising tide is lifting a lot of boats in the Harbor. I mean, I think about um, game day up in Nebraska with the volleyball team, with the women's volleyball team. I mean, let's, it's going to spread sideways too, for women athletes everywhere and at, at every sport. And that feels super exciting too. The soccer girls, obviously like they're plowing up their own ground. Um, and so it's just a fun time to be a fan right now. And just, a, it feels like a really exciting time to be raising daughters, um, where some of those limitations that were just a fact of life for generations, you know, you, this is your ceiling. That's as far, we don't even have anything above it. Um, those are just busting and it's exciting. I want to talk, I want to talk about Dear Black Girls. I mean, I guess you just didn't have enough going on. You're like, you know what? I have so much free time. I think I'll be an author. <laughs> it's about to come out and this is really exciting and i i really want to talk to you about it um, first of all i saw that it's um it's in the imprint with moment of lift with melinda gates and that that women's empowerment powerhouse for sure so i'd love to see that i love her really respect her um First of all, let's talk about why this book, who's it for, what made you decide to write it? Because writing a book is a lot of work. It's a whole yeah. job. Yes. And you already have a whole job. Yes. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, it's definitely a lot. Uh, I never really thought it would be that much. Because uh, I mean, I see it. I'm like, okay, over time, you just kind of do it. But uh, it was a lot, I guess, probably because I also in season, but I have an awesome team that made sure that I was on my P's and Q's and made it really simple for me. Uh, But I just really, I wrote two experts through Players Tribune about, it was Dear Black Girls and Dear Black Women. And I remember I wrote, I think it was one before the bubble, one after the bubble. And it was such a great feeling because a lot of people came to me and was like, oh my gosh, yes, you nailed it right on the head. And it wasn't just black women. It was just a lot of different women. And that's what I loved about it because I was like, okay, we're not, I'm not just generating one thing. I'm generating a lot of different. That's what I wanted to form it into a book because I'm like, okay, I have a lot more to say. Like you guys love that. Imagine, let me just tell you guys. The- and um, obviously it's titled Dear Black Girls, but I try to tell everyone that it's literally a book for anyone and everyone, because it's just a lot of different gems that I try to speak on and try to touch throughout the book that I experienced and how I got through it. And I feel like I only would name it Dear Black Girls because it's very rare that we see Black women getting something that's so positive and uplifting without the trauma, without the the same old, same old, like, oh, we get it. We have to bust through all these walls to get just there. And so that's what I really wanted to put forward. It was just like, this is going to be an uplifting book about how I go through things and you see me on court and you understand that I go through it, but this is how I got out of it. And these are different ways and how many people that I leaned on to help me get to this point. And I think a lot of people just kind of need to hear that. And particularly the, the black woman, because she's the one that gets disrespected a lot. She's the one that gets wrapped underneath the rug a lot. She's the one that does She has to change everything just to be present. And that's hard and it gets tiring and it gets exhausting. And so anytime that I can have a chance throughout the book to let them know that I'm here and I've been through it and I see them, uh, that was the moment. And I loved it. I loved writing it, reading it. I love speaking it. I did the audio book. My audio book is definitely the favorite. uh, Because I saw a picture of you doing it. (laughs) How many (laughs) gallons of tea did you have to drink? It's hard, isn't it, to record an audio book? hard and I'm just like, ah. but no it's just it's it's a fun yeah. it's a fun book uh because you also see a little piece of me and I think that's another reason that helps my game grow but our game grow as well it's just giving people a little bit of insight into my life just to kind of show them that 
one, I'm not perfect. Uh, two, I'm not perfect at all. And three, I'm never going to be perfect. And and there was once a time where I thought I had to be perfect in order to be successful, in order to be where I am today. And a lot of people feel that. A lot of women feel that you have to look a certain way, talk a certain way, be a certain way just to be where we want to be. And just telling people how to navigate through that was a lot of fun. Um, but no, it's it was it, I still can't believe it when the people show me that they have the book. I'm like, oh, my God, it's real. Like it hasn't come out yet. And you're reading it and when people text me. It's like I can't wait. Book tours coming up. It's like, oh, it's just an awe uh, because I'm like, oh, it's here. Like, I can't believe it. Like, when I see it, I'm like, oh, not only because my face is on it, but it's like, these are my words. Like, these are people that are people are going to read this, feel something. And I love that. <laughs> I do too. I, I really appreciate your approach to it. Um, I have a black daughter. She's a senior in high school. And, and so we walk through not just all the precarious issues around being a woman, um, but particularly for her around being a young black woman. And I crave leaders for her, black leaders for her who are eight who tell her, sure, of course, you have a strength about you. It's in your bones. It's in your DNA. It's in your genetics. Like this is, this is your ancestors. Also, you can be silly. Also, you deserve joy. Also, you can be weird or nerdy, or there's a million ways for you to be beautiful. And it, it doesn't always have to be include you putting on a cape. Um, and that message matters. It matters so much, especially from someone like you who is so respectable and you're so admired. Um, and so therefore you have earned trust. You have people believe you, they trust you. Um, and that's weighty. It's a responsibility, but I just love that you are using it in this particular way. Can you talk about, cause you mentioned you include in the book, um, some of the women who built you. Um, some of the people who really created you to be who you are today. Can you talk about a couple of those yeah. people in your life? Yeah, well, three has to be just my grandmother, my mom, and Coach Daly. Yes, <laughs> those three women have instilled so many different things in me, and and I love that, and I love them the most, obviously, uh, because they have just done so much and it's not even necessarily things that they've said but things that i've saw the things that i've seen and things obviously they build in me but i think the biggest thing i always like say i even had it on my shoes was like if you can see her you can be her and i'm like if i just be present in some of these moments to have a seat at some of these tables it's like groundbreaking because we are so used to not being able to have a seat at the table that it's like no i'm here now like i have a seat I here I am. I, and I love what I do. <clears throat> and I'm not changing who I am to get to that point. And like, that was my grandmother. My grandmother was like, I'm going to be me. Take it or leave it. I'm still going to be me. And I'm like, to see her navigate through that at such a young age and to really be like, Asia, you can really run your race at your own pace. has been just a beautiful thing for me to live through. Like, I'm just like, and the, at the end, I'm like, grandma, I want to do this. I want to do this. I want to be this. I want to do this. And she's like, okay. But do it. Like, I get it. It sounds great. But do it. Like, what are you What are you going to do to do it? And, like, I still have those memories and moments where I'm like, okay, I'm saying I want to do all these things. Do it. Like, it's cool to say, but what am I going to do to do it? And I love always just being present in those moments. And I love to have my, a person like my mom that's like, well, I'm going to make sure you do it. Since you're telling me you want to do these things, I'm going to do it. Like, the self-accountability that they've instilled in me allows me to pour that into someone else. Be like, okay, I can be that leader for my teammates and hold them accountable because I'm like, I want y'all to do the same for me. And then, I mean, Coach Daly just always taught me about discipline and how to be professional, but also be myself. Like, she always be like, be you. Like, I, I didn't recruit you to be, like, just on the bench doing nothing. I recruited you to be the best player in the gym. And, like, those little honest moments were so key. And I'm like, yes, I am so disciplined now at the pros. I try to be – I would hopefully – Cause people are like, oh, what's your transition like? And I'm like, it's pretty good because my coach taught me how to be a pro before I even made it to the pros. So I didn't get, I didn't get hit upside the head like, oh, dang, what's going on? Like, no, I kind of held myself to the standard. And I'm like, I'm not going to let anyone beat me to it. And those three women just 
were just incredible because like you said, they allow me to be joyful. They allow me to be free and be myself and kind of touch the stove and get burned a couple of times. Like they allow me to figure it out and not in a way that's like, all right, bye girl, you're on your own. It was more so like, I'm gonna hold your hand the whole way. You need to figure it out. And that's, that's kind of what I say in my book. It's like, I can sit here and tell you guys, oh, this is how you do it. And you got to do drink your water and go outside and get sunlight. Like I can give you all these steps, but that's for me. Like you have to find things that's on your own and understand that it's okay to be different. It's okay to look different. Like young girls are all the time. It's like, what do I need to do to do this? I'm like, girl, just keep doing what you're doing. Like it's, a, that's your path. I don't want you to think your path's going to look like mine. And I think once you get past that, that's when that self work comes in. And that's when you're like, okay, I'm good at where I am. And those three women really helped me navigate through that. What, um, cause you are a leader, you're a leader now on the court and off the court. Um, you have now put yourself in a position as an author, um, to really widen out your sphere of influence. And now the next generation is really listening in a different way. Um, not just the ones who have aspirations to be an athlete, um, at whatever level, but all of them. And so if you had to sort of distill down what, what is your dream for the next generation, not just of girls, but specifically for black girls, what's your dream for them? These young girls coming up right now who are going to come of age in the next decade or so. Oh, what's my dream? Um, what do we want? What do you want them to know? And what do you want them to project? You know, I just really want them to know that. And I feel like I just sound like a broken record, but just it's okay to not form into what people want you to be. I think that is like the the piece that gets lost in the sauce because we're like, oh, we want to, like I said, like I just thought I had to have bone straight hair when I went to school because I'm like, I have to look like them. I have to look like my peers. And it's like, no, like you are beautiful inside and out. And I think that is the, my, probably the key thing that I would want the next year. It's like knowing that they're beautiful inside and out. It doesn't help because pick up a phone and false reality is right there in your face telling them that like you're beautiful inside and out and that little kid in you will never die. Like always keep that alive, always be in tune with that in yourself because that's what takes you far in life. It's, it could be, you can have all the money in the world. You could be, it, you can do whatever you want, but at the end of the day, if that inside, if that inside's not right, it's going to be really, really hard to enjoy. And I think once you get that inside right, you can then project beauty, beauty. like you can project beauty and not just look, but just soul wise. I think a lot of people, we kind of shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes because we're like, oh, well, they look like that and they have that and I don't, I'm not even doing that. And they're like, comparison is like the tip of joy, honestly. Like they say, it's just like, that's kind of what I want to leave for Black women. It's like, yes, you can, like, kids are always blown away. They're like, you playing nails, you playing lash. Like, yes, why not? That's me off the court. Why can't I be that on the court? Like, never fallen into this cookie cutting mindset of I have to be this in order to get here. Like, no, be yourself. Never let anyone shake you from that. And I think that's the seed that I want to continue to plant for the next generation is I can be me and still be really good at what I do and still love what I do. And I don't have to get shaked off the top at mm -hmm. all. Yeah. Shout <laughs> that from the rafters. That's good. <laughs> It's really good. One last question. Yeah. I we I, I would love to hear you talk about your foundation, about the Asia Wilson Foundation. And yeah. this is near and dear to you. Um, yeah. so can you talk about what it is and why and why you are passionate about this? Yeah. Yes. Well, Asia Wilson Foundation, I love to say that's my first baby because my second baby is my candle business. But my first baby, Asia Wilson Foundation, came apart because I am dyslexic. I was diagnosed with dyslexia, I want to say, maybe my sophomore, junior year in high school. And something that uh, I struggle with a lot because you know, I'm a high school kid. It's like with the years of lives where things are changing. And I'm like, people are going to think I can't read. People are going to think that I'm like, I, I'm, I can't do anything right. 
And it was, and it's something that I kept hearing from a lot of people because I didn't want them to feel sorry for me. I didn't want them to pick at me. And it was something that was very hard for me and my family to come to grips with. But as I got older and once I got to South Carolina and I started getting the resources that I needed in order to be successful, in order to pass tests, I was like, this is something everyone needs. Like, just help. Resources. Because I'm lucky at these resources. Yeah, I'm on a scholarship and it's good and I'm good. But it's like, it's a lot of young kids. There's a lot of kids at the University of South Carolina that probably didn't get the resources that I had. So I knew as soon as I got out of college, I wanted to form a foundation that helped give resources to families and children with learning disabilities. Yes, we may pinpoint on dyslexia because that's what I'm familiar with. But overall, as a whole, like it, everyone needs help. And I think that was why I take so much pride in it. And it's just my baby because I'm like, if I didn't have these resources, I wouldn't even be able to talk with you now. <laughs> and that's how big of a difference it is. And so when we go to have different things with Microsoft and go to libraries and letting kids have these reading, help, help, help people read the tests for them and see their eyes light up. And I'm like, oh, I wish I had this in elementary school. Like that's what fuels me to continue to help grow my foundation because I'm like it's a lot of teachers out there that miss young kids with learning disabilities because totally. they be certified in especially teaching. black kids especially yeah. black girls yes, like because- it drops precipitously and, it's, mm-hmm. and you would never even think about it because like we ran into it like my mom I was like mom something's not right like I study and it's still not right it's just oh Asian you're just being a teenager like just study harder study harder and I'm like okay cool yeah, but, and it's like, it's so many kids that are screaming for help, screaming for help. And it's like, maybe the teacher just doesn't know, or maybe she's not certified to identify it. And it's like those little things, getting teachers certified to identify when a child is struggling can save five years from a kid that's going to maybe want to act out in school because he's like, nobody understands me. It's like different things that add on. It's like, if we can nip it in the bud and find a solution and give them the resources, Maybe that stops them from quitting sports because they're like, I don't want to do it or quitting school. I don't want to deal with it. So, yeah, when it comes to my foundation, I'm like, how can we give? And it's not just the child with the learning disability. It's the family as well. How can we help parents to know how to study with their child? How can they help their kid? How can they be like, OK, I need not be afraid to speak up and say I need some help. And so that right there is what I love about my foundation, because not only me and my family pour into it, but it's like it's a it's really a family. We really want to gravitate and help the next generation out because it's hard. I'm like, I until this day, I'm like, yeah, it just took me a couple of years to say openly that I'm dyslexic because I'm like, I don't want people to be like, do we yeah. need to? And it's like, no, I'm OK. <laughs> Good for you. So, yeah, it's, just to have help, it's huge. That's so great. I mean, that that literally changes people's lives. Yeah. Um, Okay. Yeah. So your book comes out, is it February 6th? Yes. Is that the date? Yeah. That is yeah. about to be here. Yeah. It's big, 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 big. Um, <laughs> can you just tell my listeners where they can find out just everything more, uh, socials, um, your foundation, the book, all of it, where do they go? Um, well, anywhere on my social handles on Twitter, it's underscore Asia Wilson 22 on Instagram. It's Asia 22 Wilson. And I also, you can type in Asia Wilson foundation on Twitter or Instagram that all comes up. And then, uh, my book, it is also tied to, uh, Melinda Gates. So anywhere that they're posting, I'm probably, my book's probably there. Um, and yeah, you can pre-order on Amazon. I think Target as well has it book tour starting. So yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. I think people sick of me by the end of February, which (laughs) you're going to be sick of yourself. Like at the end of a book tour, you're just like, I don't want it. I don't, I don't even like this book anymore. Like I I, I don't, nobody read it. Like (laughs) I don't want to talk about it anymore. I don't want you to ask me a question about it. (laughs) Uh, You're going to have a great time. This is a whole different kind of tour. Um, uh Uh-huh. Yeah. It just, I'm telling you, it might be just as exhausting as being a pro athlete. <laughs> You'd be sick of planes. Excited. I'm excited for you. And I'm going to put that up. All my listeners, I'll have all this for you. Uh, every single thing, as you just mentioned, all of her handles, her book, her foundation, I'll put that in one spot for you. Um, I'm so just delighted to have met you. You're just, 
you're as wonderful off the court as on. And it makes me so proud of you. I don't know if that's a, I don't, I mean that in the nicest way, like I'm proud of you. You are so gifted, but you are using your influence in such powerful, important ways. And you don't have to, you could just be a successful star athlete. Um, but the way that you're using your time and your energy and your, your resources and your influence is so, so powerful. So thanks for bringing it to my little show. I mean, my <laughs> listeners are going to go bonkers. So great Thank to you meet so you. Much. I'm great just cheering for you forever. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>